Well, if you have your Bibles there, you might like to uh, turn to Judges chapter 13. We missed you last week. Um, it's so good to have you back. And uh, yeah, I think it deserves a hand. And sadly, I don't have any really big words for you today. But uh, we'll try and manufacture some <laughs> along the way. First, to um, ask you what are the four values of our church, I'm sure you'll immediately respond with four words. Inform, transform, enrich and outreach. And so each Sunday we endeavour to try to cover those as, uh, as we do. So this is a part of our time of informing. It's not the only informing that we do, but where we look at the Word of God. Um, but uh, even as we've been singing, some of those words have been so precious and so on that, uh, that's informing us. Transforming has to do with worship. It's impossible to worship without being transformed under the power of God. You'd agree? But also uh, uh, what we are informed about God and about ourselves transforms us so that we want to, uh, want to have that change, that transforming take place in, uh, in our lives. And then inreach, of course, has to do with fellowship, which already this morning we've been able to do, but also has to do with the corporate worship that we gather together. And um, afterwards, as we uh, gather together over a coffee or tea, whatever, that there will be more fellowship takes place, not just friendship. This is doing the journey with Jesus um, in particular. And then, of course, outreach as uh, we go out from this place. Um, you know that our mission statement is committed to growing in Christ, committed to going for Christ. And years ago, we used to have um, on below the screen in the olden days, when the screen was a fixed screen, we used to have the first words, committed to growing in Christ. And then above the door out there, as we walked out the door, um, we used to have those words committed to going for Christ. And I said to somebody once about, well, what are we going to put over this door over there? And their response was, we're committed to going for coffee. Um, <laughs> So uh, I can't remember who it was who said that. Um, if I could, I'd be pray for them sincerely. But, uh, but So what I, I'm really wanting us to focus on this morning is that as we study the Word of God, that the aspect of opening ourselves up to the Spirit of God that He might transform us is a key part of this next um, uh, couple of hours or whatever, how long it takes me to preach this morning, 30 minutes or thereabouts. I want to pray. And so, Father, we lay ourselves before you this morning, open ourselves up to you. These are values in our church, the inform, transform, inreach and outreach. We know that they are values which are based on your word. They are values which are important to you, so important that you've impressed on us as a church that they need to be values which we indeed value. So as we look at this, uh, this life of Samson this morning, well, just aspects of it this morning, um, Lord, we, uh, we pray that for each and every one of us, for me, for everybody seated here today, that there will be a sense that you want to speak to us, you want to do a work in our lives. So whether we're here or whether we're even at home watching it on, uh, on the video link or watch it later, we would pray that your spirit might move in us today. Amen. Well, Samson is, um, is quite a, a long life. Um, so uh, we're going to see that he judged for about 20 years and so not sure how old he was when he became a judge, uh, maybe 20, 25. So these three chapters of chapters uh, 40, 30, 40, 15, 16, uh, these chapters cover that whole period of time. So there's a lot about Samson's life that we are unable to cover. By the way, you'll see that it says Samson, Israel's last judge, and next week we're going to look at his second last judge. <laughs> now we're looking, going backwards a bit in looking at Gideon next week. Um, so you might have particular thoughts about Samson's life and about some of the things which he did, and we probably won't get to covering those today unless you did give me uh, three or four hours or so, which I'm sure that you won't want to... Uh, put up with me for that long and I certainly don't want to speak for that long. But let me just read just a selection of verses um, from, uh, from these chapters. So 
chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. So if you've got your old-fashioned Bible there or you need to boot up your iPhone or whatever, then follow this through. 13, 1 to 5 reads, Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for, for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of Danites had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Um, and then down to verse 24, which uh, reads this way. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanae Dan between Zorah and Eshtol. Don't worry about those words there. And this uh, chapter 16 and verse 17 to 20 um, reads this way, it says, so he told her everything. This is uh, Samson and Delilah. He told her everything, no razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head was shaved, my strength would leave me and I'd become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Um, then she called Samson, the Philistines, on you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free but he did not know that the Lord had left him. Uh, sad, isn't it, for a man's life to him that way. Um, just uh, some of this stuff, is, uh, some of these things we want to say, just go over very, very quickly because there's some other things we want to focus on this morning. But it comes as no surprise as we've been working our way through the book of Judges that chapter 13 and verse 1... Um, introduces the times to us. So this is what's happening. Where chapter 13 and verse 1 says, again. <laughs> How many times have we read this? Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them, this time, into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. So Israel did evil. And, um, and just one thing I want to uh, just mention briefly here is that just to remember that as we've gone through the book of Judges that constantly it's been talking about Israel as a nation sinning. So it's been talking about national sin and uh, whereas most of the time when we've been preaching we've tended to take um, this, this idea of national sin and apply it to us personally and individually and it's okay to do that and it's right that we do that. However, sometimes we can miss this, that in actual fact that what was happening here is that this was Israel as a nation that was sinning. And it brings to our mind the whole concept, the whole idea that in the Word of God that the Bible often talks about this whole area of corporate sin. And, uh, and, and for us to be thinking about that and how that might apply for us today. So for us to be considering, for example... Um, is there a national sin for Australia? Uh, would this be said about us? But we could also apply it a bit further and we could say, when we're talking about corporate sin, I wonder whether there might be a corporate sin in some churches. Now, immediately we want to hark up a bit about that, so this is the Lord's church or whatever. 
but I'm sure when most of us, maybe all of us, when we stop and think about it, would respond sadly and say, yes, sometimes there is a corporate sin in churches. That a church as a whole, it could be said, that, uh, that this church is not honouring God in the way that they are living. Or we could perhaps, perhaps even bring it a bit closer to us in a corporate sense and say, what about families? Are there families where there might be a corporate sin that, uh, that needs to be dealt with? And once again, I don't know what your observation has been or maybe even your experience, but to say, yes, there are cases where there is a corporate sin which is uh, which has taken hold as a family, which is a part of their DNA, which needs to be dealt with. And so let's remember this, that this is talking um, about this whole concept of corporate sin, which is important for us to be thinking about. So to have on the one hand, what is God saying to me personally, but what is God saying to us in the corporate sense into the... the um, the communities which I belong to, uh, for example, family or church. And as we've read that, uh, that uh, God punished them and for the same verse, chapter 13, verse 1, that they're under the Philistines for a period of, uh, of 40 years, which when you stop and think about it, that's a long time. Take 40 years from back from now and think back at all that's happened in that time. It was for this whole period of time where the Philistines ruled over the children of Israel as a part of their punishment. And then following that or as a part of that, uh, towards the end of that time, uh, Samson is being raised up and uh, he led or he judged for a period of 20 years. And uh, these 20 years, it's mentioned a couple of times, chapter 15 and verse 20 and chapter 16 and verse 31. I want us to focus on this man, this character called Samson. And to realise this is that Samson was a person, was a man who was specially chosen by God. Um, In the reading, which we have read, of course, we've seen that even before Samson was born, even before he was conceived, God had him in his mind. And so there was this whole idea that God had a plan that God plus Samson were going to work in a partnership. And I think this is another theme, is it not, that has come through again and again in the book of Judges where it's always God plus a person. And we've applied that to us as well. God plus you, God plus me, is that God and me working together. And so God and Samson having this partnership of working together. And we read there that Samson, is is this character who's, who's born to a childless couple but his mother was going to have these special conditions. By the way, you know what Samson's mother's name was? Uh, If you know, let me know, because it's never recorded anywhere. We know who his dad was, um, Manoah, but then it just refers to his his mother as either being his mother or Manoah's wife. But it says there in chapter 13, uh, when the angel of the Lord came to her, you're going to conceive, and here are some specific things which you are going to have to live by even before Samson was born. So he's set aside right from before conception. He's set aside, as as we read this morning, that he was to be a Nazarite for the whole of his life. Chapter 30, verse 5. We'll come back to that. But just want to point this out, that he was a man with significant character flaws or a significant character flaw that his emotions will see override his being led by the Spirit of God. So what evidence is there? What's the Bible say here about God and Samson? Here are some of the references in these verses. Okay, chapter 13 and verse 5, that he was dedicated to God from the womb. Chapter 13 and verse 13, it was God-directed rearing. So Samson's mum, before she was a mum, the angel of the Lord came and said, um, uh, you know, the, this person came so I'm going to conceive. Um, she runs off, tells the husband, and he says, well, if that's really of God, I wonder whether we can have him 
whether he'd come back again. God, please send him back again. So it's just to show that this is from you. The angel of the Lord comes back and Manoah says to him, what instructions do you have for us if we're going to raise this person, raise this baby, this kid? And so there's this God-directed rearing. And then here are a pile of verses that says about Samson. Chapter 13 and verse 24, that he was blessed by God. 13 and verse 25 says the Spirit stirred him. Chapter 14 and verse 19, the Spirit came powerfully. Chapter 15 and verse 14, the Spirit came powerfully. And so you get this picture, surely now, of, of, um, of God and Samson. God wanting to arrange or to go into this partnership and God... Uh, aligning himself with Samson, uh, just infusing himself uh, with Samson, with his life, and that, uh, Samson, you and I have got a job to do. But what we'll discover, and you're probably already aware of this, is that while God was doing his part, Samson had not partnered adequately with God. And then we read that last part, which we just read a while ago about God and Samson, that chapter 16 and verse 20 says this, that the Lord had left him. Um, what, a, what, an indict, what a terrible thing to occur. So, Samson was going to be a Nazarite. So, what is a Nazarite? I want to just um, clarify that a Nazarite is not a Nazarene. A Nazarene is somebody who is from Nazareth. So that's a Nazareth. Nazarene is somebody from Nazareth. But a Nazarite is, um, is something completely different. A Nazarite is a person, male or female, who took out specific vows before God. And all of these vows and all the things that are, or the vow and all the requirements of that vow um, are outlined in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Um, and uh, so uh, if you want to know some more details about what a Nazarite is, if you're thinking about doing such a thing, if God's leading you that way, you'll need to memorise Numbers 6, 1 to 21. And, and the meaning of the Nazarite, the Nazarene is somebody from Nazareth, but the meaning of the Nazarite means to separate, consecrate or to abstain. That's from the New Bible Dictionary. And here's what it involves. Number one, to abstain from wine or grapes or any intoxicating liquor, any intoxicating drink. That was part of the vow. Uh, secondly, no haircuts um, is, is another thing. And uh, thirdly, there's also to stay away from dead bodies and unclean food. So they're the three primary things. There's a lot more in, uh, in Numbers chapter 6. But they're the key things in this vow. No alcohol. Um, stay away from, uh, from unclean things, from corpses. Um, uh, even if somebody undertook a vow, uh, a Nazarite vow, and uh, a relative died, uh, number six says uh, here are some things that need to be done. Had to start the vow all over again. But, uh, and thirdly, this other aspect of not having a haircut. And so it's important for us to understand this in the, in the light of Samson as we examine his life. Now, for the Nazarites, um, the vow might only be for a specific period of time and uh, once that vow, that period of time uh, was completed, then there was uh, things to do. Cut your hair, burn the hair, uh, as a sacrifice, all sorts of things. Number six, go home and read it if you want to follow that through. So for some people it was just a temporary thing, but there was for some where it was a whole of life. Samson being one of the ones where right from birth he was told that he was to be a Nazarite all the way through. Samuel is another one. And while it's not specific, it's thought that maybe John the Baptist may have been a Nazarite as well. And there's less less evidence, less support, but maybe even James, the brother of Jesus, may have also been a Nazarite. So there are some examples. Um, there are some for the whole of life, but as I said, most people taking a Nazarite vow was only for a specific period of time. 
So this is what Samson was born into. Samson, your mother has taken a Nazarite vow. You read that and see that she was to do these sorts of things. When you have your son Samuel, uh, Samson rather, Samson is going to have to be a Nazarite right from birth all the way through, uh, all the way through his life. No grapes, no alcohol, no nothing, uh, no haircuts, don't touch any dead corpse or touch any unclean food. So let's get into this life of Samson a bit. So when we turn to chapter 14 and verse 5, what do we read there in chapter 14 and verse 5? Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. And what's the next verse say, the next phrase say? As they approached what? The vineyards of Timnah. Samson, what are you doing around the vineyard? Samson, you've taken a vow that you're to abstain, stay away from all of this sort of thing. Stay away from grapes, stay away from wine, stay away from all of this. And then we read of Samson and his family approached the vineyard. Uh, Vow broken. But then we go down, chapter 14 and verse 8, and we read this. Sometime later... Uh, by the way, uh, in the meantime, as he's going down there, he kills this lion, rips it apart. Uh, so you, you see that um, in, in verse 5. Okay, so he kills this lion. And then uh, chapter, chapter 14 and verse 8. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, which he'd just killed previously. Samson... What are you doing around a carcass? Remember the Nazarite vow. Remember no wine, no grapes, no touching dead bodies of any sort. He killed this lion and he immediately goes, up, not immediately, after a period of time going back, so ah, this is where I killed the lion, wonder what it looks like today. And goes over to it and not only that, In the the carcass was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate it as he went along. So here he is breaking the vow of touching a carcass, but also taking this food from, which is unclean, this honey from that, and starting to consume that. Remember all the things that God had said, that uh, all the things about the spirit, Uh, all his dealings with Samson. And here we are already, Samson in the vineyard, Samson with the dead carcass, Samson eating unclean food. And then you know, ultimately, in chapter 16 and verse 18, what does he do? Well, he goes to sleep on his wife's lap. Some commentators said, how can you sleep? Uh, through getting your head shaved and some have said probably because he was as drunk as a skunk. Uh, There's no evidence for that but some have suggested that because of the lifestyle that he lived but then he gets his hair cut. Three stripes are out, mate. And and it seems that at this time that when he gets up ready to to fight um, that the Lord had left him. And sometimes we jokingly say Samson uh, lost all his strength when he got his hair cut. No. All the downfall happened. Why? Because he broke the vow with God. This is my vow before God that I'm going to live as a Nazarite. That's the vow. But I'm really going to ignore that and go and do my own thing. And God does not honour willful disobedience well that's the breaking of the Nazarite vow but I want us to approach his life from a bit of a different perspective as well because there's four women in his life as well well at least four Um, his mother doting 
uh, doting mum. Uh, just think of how she must have felt. Um, her and Manoa trying for so long to have a family and you may be in that situation, be aware of folk who've been in that situation and then finally she conceives and they have a son. And, um, and, and so here's this Samson born to, uh, to Manoa and his wife and no doubt a doting mother. And, and just reading between the lines, it just seems to me that when I look at the life of Samson, when I read about it, it seems that he's so precious in his mother's eyes that whatever Samson wants, Samson gets. He's a favourite. Well, he's the only one, probably. And, um, and so valued, so precious in his parents, in his mother's eyes, that whatever, whatever Samson wants, he gets. He just seems to be that sort of a character. I, I see this and I want it. And you read that in chapter 14 and verses, uh, verses 1 to 8 about, uh, about his wife, his first wife. It says, Samson went down to Tinmar and he saw a young Philistine woman. No, she's not an Israelite, she's a Philistine. Parents try to talk him out of it. That's a, another part of the story. But, but he sees this stunning Philistine woman and he says what? I want her. Um, so he saw her. And, and later on the story goes, by the way, just so if, if you're marking a Bible or highlighting it, just underline and mark this, that word saw because we're going to come back to that. Later on, there's a bit of a mix-up. His wife gets given to someone else or whatever. And so Samson gets upset with all of this in chapter 15 and verse 2. Um, thought uh, his dad thought oh, he didn't like her anymore. So, um, so uh, or his father-in-law rather wouldn't let him go in. And then he says, "This I was so sure you thoroughly hated her." He said that I gave her to your friend. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Um, there's no evidence. It doesn't say what happened there, but hey. You think her sister, you think your wife is a good-looking, stunning one. What about a younger sister? What about her? Take her. So there's the first wife and then in chapter 16 and verse 1, we read about one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went and spent the night with her. It's woman number three. Once again, if you see, if you're marking your Bible, underline that word saw. He saw. And then chapter 16 and verse 4, um, it says this, it's a bit different. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So it's not so much as seeing, but he fell in love. Um, it's different. So there's the four women in Samson's life, that um, his mum, first wife, prostitute, second wife. See the recurrence in the couple of those of how Samuel saw, uh, Samson saw, I saw, I want, I see, I want. Then with Delilah, there's four secrets that we want to take a, um, have an awareness of. Here are the four secrets. Delilah says to him, because she's being bribed by the Philistines, where his wife's loyalty is more to her country than to her husband, and her countrymen come to her and say, find out what Sam Samson's strength is. She asks him and uh, says, chapter 16 and verse 7, if you tie me up with fresh bowstrings, I'd lose my power, break them. Second time, tie up with new ropes. Third time, braid my hair into a loom. Folk, don't you think that Samson, at a, after attempt number three, would start to think, I wonder whether my wife has got it in for me? Um, doesn't that strike you? Maybe he was all strength and all muscle and no brain or something. But, but just men, just be aware of that. And women even be more aware of that. 
that if the same thing happens two or three times, you've got to start thinking, is there a pattern here? And finally she says to him on the fourth occasion, you know what it really is, is if I break my vow with God. Well, that's not the word she uses, but that's what's happening. If I finally break my vow with God, God leads me and I lose my strength. So what went wrong? I want to say, first off, that where it started to go wrong was in that word that I've asked you to underline, was that he saw. In chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman and he said to his mum and dad, I need her, I want her. And if you duck down to 14 and verse 7, He went down later and talked with the woman and what? Oh, he liked her. Isn't that interesting? I see this beautiful Philistine woman. I've got to have her as my wife. Mum and dad, get her for me. And then later on, he goes and has a chat with her. Oh, by the way, I like her. She's not a bad sort even to talk to. Um, And chapter 16 and verse 1 also says about how how, um, Samson saw, was attracted He's a womanizer and he saw. But I want to say this and just talk to men for a minute. You know exactly what's going on here, don't you? Because us men really respond to the eye gate. And we respond just to, to beauty more than anything else. And folk, it's something we've got to address and address very, very early. We've got to do something about it. And if women, if you're not so sure about that, then I encourage you to do this. Go to the beach or go to a shopping centre. Wait till a stunning woman walks by and then don't look at her, but look at the eyes of all the men round about. And you'll know what I'm talking about. And you see, men, we just have to guard our eyesight. That's how God has wired us, but that's not the excuse to let it go wild but rather it's something that we need to bring under control and that's why it's so difficult in a day like today when it's so easy on the internet to, to access pornography. So we've got to stay away from that. And we've got to keep our, our guard on our eyes even just looking around about us. We need to do this. And this was Samson's downfall is that he was more than happy just to let his eyes eyes just roam free and then to respond accordingly. Ah, she's a beauty, I need her. She's a beautiful woman, I need her for a wife. She's a beautiful looking prostitute, I need her for the night. And this is how he was responding. And so what we need to understand here is this, is that his emotions overruled his obedience to God. And in Samson's case, it's, uh, it's a case of his eyesight, what he was looking at. But for us, it could be any other emotion. And we've got to ask ourselves this question. Where is God in all of this? Is it best for me or others? Or does it focus on me or others? I can see my time has gone and I've still got a bit to say. Please forgive me. I want to just quickly look at some sin statements. And I want just to have a look at these and uh, just to see how they apply. Sin num- uh, statement number one is this, is that sin blinds, then it binds, and then it grinds. Blinded Samuel, it, uh, Samson, it bound him, and then it brought him down. This next statement, which I heard from uh, Chuck Swindoll, and whether it's his or someone else's, says that sin will take you further than what you want want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. And then there's this other statement to be aware of. It's easier to deal with the temptation than the aftermath of sin. If you want a philosophical definition of sin, sin is the irrational assertion of one's own independence. If you want a theological statement, sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. If you want a practical one, 
Sin is anything that takes precedence in my life ahead of God. What we have here is that at the end of, uh, towards the end of his life, Samson is at the end of his rope. Do you remember a sermon which I preached on the 17th of September this year when I gave everybody a bit of rope? Do you remember that? Some do, some don't. Um, I said, when, when do we pray best? We pray best when we're at the end of our rope. And the encouragement was this, is that don't wait till you get to the end of your rope, but pray first. And that was the verse, seek first the kingdom of God, was the verse that I preached on. But it wasn't until Samson was at the end of his rope, after breaking all the vows, that he turns and prays to God. Samson called out to the Lord, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Please strengthen me just this once, God, so that I may get full revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. You know the outcome. But Judges ends badly. It says at that time, the last verse in the book of Judges says this, at that time there was no king in Israel. People did whatever they felt like doing. Sin is lawlessness. It's how, how people were living. So what about you and me? What about our vow? The Bible is full. I'm just talking to people who are Christians now, the Bible is full about our obligations, about God and us working together. And, and I've just chosen this one verse, or two verses, 1 Corinthians 6, 6, 19 and 20. It says this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? You are bought with the price you're actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then honour and glorify God with your body. Folk, this is a vow for every believer. Don't you know that you as a believer, that I as a believer, that I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. God indwells me. That's what the temple is. How did I come there? Because I've been bought. I've been bought with the price. The price is the precious blood of Jesus. How precious how valuable that is and so I'm no longer my own I'm no longer my own but I'm here to do whatever God wants me to do and because of that then I must honour and glorify God in my body God and you working together not like Samson and God God's doing his part but where's Samson one story and I'm through a couple of months ago I had a dream I had other dreams too and I probably have a lot of dreams that much, many I don't remember but um, I had this, what I think is a significant dream for me and um, it's still very vivid in my mind. And this is how the dream went. Um, I was with a group of people, uh, I don't know who they were, but I was with a group of people and, a, and I was asked a question, David, what is the most important lesson you've learned in your spiritual life. And in my dream, I paused for a minute and I thought, if you really want me to answer that, I really need some time to think about it. And so I walked away. And the next thing in my dream, I was pushing a wheelbarrow along. Even as I say, it's clear in my mind the picture of the dream. I was pushing this wheelbarrow along and this voice came to me and said, this is the most important lesson you've learned in your spiritual life. It's you and God working together. In a wheelbarrow, you need two hands on it. One hand, it won't work. You need two hands. It's God and me working together, working through life. That is the most important lesson in your spiritual life. I determined I was going to go and buy a little wheelbarrow <laughs> to put on my desk. And I didn't get around to it until I had to preach this and I was going to use this illustration. So I went out and bought a wheelbarrow to put on my desk where I can see it every day. The most important lesson in life is this. God and me working together. Samson forgot that. He never put it into practice. But I'll let God do it all. 
and I'm not going to do anything. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work if I try to do everything and leave God out of the picture. It's God and me working together. God will do his part. Will you do yours? Remember, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've been bought with the price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. You are not your own. Therefore, honour and glorify God in your body. Let's pray. Oh Lord, what a hard lesson it was for Samson to learn. Help us, Lord, to learn vicariously, to learn from his example and not to go down the same pathway. Lord, help us every time we use a wheelbarrow to remember that this is the picture of a spiritual life, you and me working together. Help us to remember every time we get a haircut that we haven't taken a Nazarite vow, but our vow is, is to stay true to Jesus. Grant us the courage and the grace to walk in step with you as our priest, to honour and glorify you, our Heavenly Father. Amen.